Welcome to the Success Journey Show. Let's travel together through the lives of individuals on the road to success. Hey, what's going on, travelers? Listen, life is a journey, and it's good to have people on your journey to success who are willing to grow, who are willing to share some directions with you, some pointers, and that's what we're doing here on the Success Journey Show. This is Ricky Venters, and I'm here with none other than Marlon Madden. Marlon, what's good, bro? How you doing? I'm chilling, brother. I'm chilling. Good, good, man. We got to get you to do one of these introductions one of, the, one of these days, man. Man, I like how I don't you, know how I got stuck with it. I, I, I like how you d- do it, man. I like how you do it. <laughs> I was like, man, why am I doing all these introductions? <laughs> you, got, you got that radio voice, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> nah, man, I, I am, uh, I'm excited, man. The, the week is going great. Um, you know, progressing on, on my goals. You know, I, I was in and out of the gym uh, the last couple of days and uh, went in today and it was just, um, it felt good, man. It, it, it speaks volume to resting your body, you know, just having that physical rest, mental rest uh, so that your body can recover and you're able to tackle on new things, man. So I'm really trying to take advantage of that. And just a lot of different aspects of life, man, that rest aspect, you know, things of that nature. That's true. I, I got to take heed to that because sometimes I try to overwork my body and mm-hmm. then my body just goes to a shutdown mode and lets me know like, hey, brother, you need to you need to relax. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, for, um, for those that don't know, Marlon has a narcolepsy. So, um, yeah, I don't know if it's old age <laughs> for him or <laughs> or rest. <laughs> but the joker will be sleep on you in a second. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. You definitely need to incorporate that resting joint in your in your regular routine. I definitely life. do. Hey, thanks for putting my business out there, man. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, today, man, we have another great guest, great phenomenal guest coming to you. And this guest is none other than Dr. Muina Bell. Hi, thank you, you for having me. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you thank for, you. Have, Pleasure for being here. So, doctor, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Muina Bell, and I am an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm also a director of a research lab, the Pulse Lab, where Pulse stands for photoacoustic and ultrasonic systems engineering. And in the Pulse Lab, we integrate optics, acoustics, and robotics to design novel imaging systems that will ultimately improve patient care. And we have a lot of Mm -hmm. new innovations and inventions that come out of the lab. And if anyone wants to know more, I invite you to visit my lab website, pulselab.jhu.edu. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. 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 So, I mean, uh, listeners, as you can tell, man, that, that right there, if you're not familiar with the, with the terminology and the lingo, then you're probably like, what in the world <laughs> does she do? And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump into it. We're, we're going to actually get to it. But I, I want to go a little further back before we even get to the point of where she became a world renowned uh, engineer to back where, you know, that journey to that point, you know, what, 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 you know, tell us about just life before school and just getting to this point of, you know, working at Johns Hopkins. Let's see. I mean, it was, it depends on where you want to start it, but I guess it was always like, you know, a lot of diligence and hard work and being good academically, being outstanding, Mm well-rounded, And Mm -hmm. always striving to be Mm -hmm. the best version of myself. And Uh, let me ask you a question because I know, um, you know, when you're explaining what you do, I I, sometimes I I have to. I'm here looking it up to make sure that I sound (laughs) like I know exactly what it is. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) 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 Because I can't, I can't fathom. But the thing about it is, for somebody like you, that I could tell that you're very um, strong academically. Have there any, ever been a point that you had a low when it comes to a- academic that you had to question yourself? Certainly not like growing up through um, like eighth grade. It was pretty like, I guess I spent a lot of time studying. So I was always prepared for like tests or exams. And then going going to high school was 
a little bit more challenging because I went to one of the three specialized high schools in New York City. So you had to take a test to get in. It was pretty much run like a, a small college. Like we all had to declare majors by the time we graduated. Oh, wow. There were a lot of like advanced placement courses. And so I took several of those in my junior and senior years. And that's actually when I, I would say that's when academics really started to challenge me because I was taking um, like I remember advanced placement physics, for example, and I really had to like spend late nights doing my homework. Hmm. And I would say that's when I felt most challenged, but I never really felt like I couldn't do it. I always felt if, as long as I put in the time and effort, I would get somewhere. Now, I might not, might, might not have always arrived at the correct solution, or I might not even have arrived at a solution to begin with, but I always felt like I made progress and that in and of itself was enough for me to feel like I accomplished something. Mm, I like that. I like that outlook. I love that outlook. So, so you're, so what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that your work ethic, you developed a good work ethic um, of studying and how to apply yourself from a younger age. How did your parents foster that, that, um, that work ethic in you? Yeah, so my mother was always a big proponent of education, even dating as far back as I can remember. And so while she never really said, you know, and by the way, I just grew up with my mother. So that's why I'm when you say parents to me, that's my mother. Um, Okay. And and, uh, so she never really like said, you know, you have to get good grades or she never said, you know, she never had to um, drill down the importance of doing my homework, but I think she more um, led by example. So she would like um, help me do my homework when I was like in kindergarten, as, that's as young as I remember. If it was like a coloring assignment, she was there with me and she would buy educational videos for, for my brother and myself. So it was both uh, two of us growing up together. We're about two year, two years apart. So there was a lot of learning through educational programming that she bought through videos or books that she bought to supplement our education. Or I remember watching a lot of Sesame Street and Reading Rainbow. So I learned a lot of educational through like PBS programming as well. And then having an older brother who was a little bit more advanced in school than I was two years older. So two years ahead of me, it was fun to see, you know, when I would, be done with my homework to see what he was working on and try to learn like the, you know, two years, what I would be learning in two years. So it it was a challenge for me. And I I liked helping my brother with his homework and sometimes he would let me do it for him. And so Hmm. that was fun. And then like (laughs) telling on your brother right now, (laughs) would you say you're telling on your brother right now? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he was, he was, he was a kind brother. He saw how much I loved it and he didn't want to steal my joy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. And what? like, I guess also, you know, we had to, um, it was more, I guess, yeah, my mom more showed, showed us the importance of education through example, taking us to school each day and making sure we were on time, buying like, the whole volume of encyclopedias when mm-hmm. really we could have, the money could have been spent on something else, but that's how she chose, you know, to spend the resources that she had. Mm-hmm. And then just sending us to a private school from like kindergarten through eighth grade, um, because that's, you know, the type of education that she valued for us and helping us to prepare to get into that specialized high school. Um, it was like basically you had to take a test that was pretty much like the SATs. And so it was a lot of practice. And I didn't realize at the time how much all of that preparation really set me up to do well on that test to pass. So it's like my mom had a vision of what she wanted for us. And she never really spoke like this is what needs to happen. But it was more so through her actions or leading by example that I, I valued education as well. Thank you for listening to the Success Journey Show. Please follow us on our social media on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at the Success Journey Show. Also, check out our website at the SuccessJourneyShow.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. So, 
So on your, you know, your pursuit of just knowledge and you seem like you, you really loved it, you know, how did you pinpoint as to, you know, what direction that you, that you wanted to go? Yeah. So I, I remember, um, from an early age, I was always interested in science and the earliest that I can remember being interested was through watching those educational videos. And I was also interest, always interested in math for some reason, um, like the educational videos about timetables when I was six years old and hearing like the songs that they sung and put the numbers together and what what times what makes what number and learning all the tunes. That was fun for me. And I remember um, watching Sesame Street and there was a, a scientist puppet there and he was mixing colors. And for some reason, I was just attracted to that kind of stuff. And I thought that was cool. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, a, he, was, he was a nerd. He was like, Man, <laughs> everybody else watching Big Bird and Oscar. You're like, let's go to the scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. And so, yeah, but that was that's and So when I saw that, I was like, oh, I want to be a scientist. And so that's kind of like, what I pursued since I was six years old is as far as, uh, as young as I can remember thinking to myself, mm. that's, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Mm. Oh, gotcha. So, so going to be a, a scientist, you know, I mean, you went to your, your undergraduate and you, you, you majored in, uh, I believe you got your first degree in mechanical engineering, right? If I'm, am I correct? Yes, I went. I was an undergrad major in mechanical engineering at MIT. Yeah, yep. MIT. Yeah, we'll just skip through that. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> Please do not. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so MIT. You know, that's that's, that's uh, respectively the number one, number two school in the nation, in the world, probably for engineering. Um, like, how, like, who, how do you think to one apply apply to mm-hmm. the school? Uh, and then tell us the feeling that you felt when you got accepted and you're walking on that campus for the first time. So honestly, like I, so let's see. So I was always interested in science. And then when I, it wasn't really until I got to high school that I even heard of engineering. Um, mm. I was selected to participate in a program to increase the number of women in engineering. So it was geared toward women women in their second year of high school so sophomores who excelled in math and science and so mm. i fit the profile and i was selected to participate because math was also one of my favorite subjects in addition to me wanting to be a scientist and that's when i, I learned about what engineering was and how it was like the application of math and science and i thought it was a perfect mix of my interests at that stage of my life and so um then it was so after participating in that program, that's when I realized that, that I really wanted to be an engineer. And um, I actually never heard of MIT <laughs> um, until I remember. Well, I remember two defining moments. One was I was at home and my uh, my brother was like flipping through a magazine and it was post participating in that program. And and he knew how much I loved engineering at that point. And so he was just flipping through a magazine. I don't know what magazine it was, but I know that there was an ad for MIT in it. And he was like, oh, you want to do engineering? You should go to this school. And so that's my first like memory of hearing what MIT was. And that's pretty much all he said to me. And then I remember like when it was time for me to actually apply to college, um, I was um, I knew I wanted to do engineering. I knew I wanted to do biomedical engineering because through that program, they introduced us to different kinds of engineering. And I um, also knew that, well, I was a high achiever. So I wanted to go to like the best engineering school possible. And so when I did like my searching for, you know, what, you know, the top ranked um, engineering school in these different kinds of engineering disciplines, just out of curiosity, there was a school that kept, showing up as number one and it was MIT. And I was like, whoa, well, this is like the number one school and I'm like number one. So therefore, <laughs> <laughs> perfect match. Perfect match. To, what'd you say? 
perfect match. <laughs> exactly. And so <laughs> even when I made that decision that I wanted to go to MIT, like I had no idea how hard it was to get into the school. I still really didn't really understand what it meant to be an MIT student and the type of, you know, rigorous education and how well renowned and valued an MIT education is. Um, I really didn't learn that until I got there. So here I am. I'm just looking. <laughs> okay. I'm just looking up rankings, and I'm like, "Oh, this school seems to always be number one." So you know, this is where I want to go, and that was pretty much how I like decided that I wanted to attend MIT, and I ended up getting in, and I was thrilled because it was like where I wanted to go. And it wasn't until I got there and heard people talk about MIT this, MIT that, and when I came back, you know, or when I would go out and people asked what school you went to and I said, oh, MIT, they're like, oh, MIT. And I was like, OK, this must be some like special. <laughs> That's probably a blessing in disguise, I'm telling you. What you say? It was probably a blessing in disguise because, you know, sometimes if you see, you know, it's like if you see a, if you actually see how deep the water is. That, You'll never jump in it. That is true. That is true. So it was more like I was very oblivious to it. I just saw, you know, and I saw it was at the top and I thought it fit it fit the bill of what I wanted to do. And I, I, I maybe. So maybe that's why there was no like hesitation to apply or no fear with applying. Um, I didn't even think twice about it. Like, do I do mm. I have what it takes? It, those thoughts never crossed my mind because, and the part of it, like, like you said, it's, I just didn't know. Mm. Can I, can I ask you what part of New York are you from? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, right? Yeah. So this uh, this is this is this is what's crazy. If somebody saw, if somebody just knew what um you from right now, they'd never be like, oh, she's from Brooklyn because. You and w- w- when you think about Brooklyn, you don't think about somebody that says, "Hey, I want to go to MIT and all this different stuff." Mm-hmm. So this show, this show that we, we're, we're doing, the Success Journey Show, we talk about no matter what your circumstances, if you apply yourself or you surround yourself with somebody that's um, guiding you in the right direction, that you can reach whatever goal you want to. Mm-hmm. And you're a perfect example. And you and you went straight to the top. You went straight to the top. So now going from I, I know I know the schools you're talking about in New York, you know, the um, the high schools. And I, I've had a couple of friends go to them. And I was some, some of my classmates in college. And I know even the level of rigor that's you know required at those schools. But that's nothing compared to an MIT level. Now, did you feel the difference in terms of going from that one environment to an MIT environment? And how did you respond to that if you did? So I believe that the high school that I went to was excellent preparation for the MIT environment in the sense mm-hmm. that it was a lot of the the courses that I took were very rigorous. So it was a lot of studying and applying myself and being challenged on a daily basis to pick up these advanced concepts that Only now do I realize normal high school students are the like, you know, majority of high school students do not have the same type of curriculum that I had in high school. (laughs) (laughs) What's what's the name of the school? Just give it a shout out. So Oh, Brooklyn Technical High School. Brooklyn Tech. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um So you're saying that rigor prepared you for the rigor that was ahead at MIT. Somewhat, because I will say, like, I, in a way, it prepared me, but then in a way, I was taken aback because here I am, like, this high achiever, always, you know, trying to do the most advanced classes possible. And then I get to MIT and I'm surrounded by high achievers, Mm -hmm. still thinking that I can do, like, the most advanced classes possible. And I learned very quickly that. I need to just be in like the normal classes. At MIT. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the advanced classes, they were on another level. <laughs> so in a way it prepared me, but then in a way I had to like recalibrate myself. <laughs> wow. Man. Wow. So, so you went through your, your, your years at MIT and then after after MIT, you, you transitioned somewhere else. And if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, you got a, 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 a another a graduate degree in a different focus of engineering. 
Yeah. So at MIT, yeah. I minored in biomedical engineering. And I was always interested in biomedical engineering, but MIT at the time did not have a major in biomedical engineering. And I chose it because it was a top rated school in mostly all other disciplines of engineering. So when it was time for me to pursue my PhD, I did my PhD in biomedical engineering, which was always my interest. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, did you do something with electrical as well? Electrical engineering? Well, I'm an, uh, I, I am an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering currently. <laughs> love it. Love it. So some people like, look, guys, I don't know if you guys gra- are grasping, you know, where I'm going with these questions. So you had someone that, you know, went to MIT, for one, went to a f- phenomenal high school, B- Brooklyn Tech, um, uh, went to a uh, uh, nothing but the top, you know, high, high education with uh, MIT uh, ranking number one, um, majored in mechanical engineering. Then with her PhD, she did bio, uh, biomedical or, bio, or biomechanical? Biomedical. Biomedical uh, for her PhD. And now she is a assistant professor in electrical and computer uh Science or engineering? Engineering. Computer, computer engineering department. Like people struggle their whole life just to do one of them. One of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm listening to you going through all the different disciplines and I'm like, <laughs> you hear people like, yeah, thank God I made it through just one, right? Because that was me. Mechanical uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> engineering, that was it. That's it, done. Mechanical <laughs> engineering. But you went to three different areas and you're excelling and doing well in those three different areas to the point of where, you know, you're operating and directing your own lab at the, at the university. Now, t- t- talk to us about just that transition of, you know, even coming to, to, to Hopkins and jumping from, you know, being a student and PhD level now to operating your own, your own space. Yeah, so um, that, that was actually a, a, like a difficult transition period for me because I would say it was the really the first time in my life where I felt like I had to, I had to really, I would say like fight to get where I am. And I say that because, um, in the past, just like, you know, Oh, I wanted to go to MIT and I applied and I got in, or, you know, I wanted to go to grad school at Duke. I applied, I told, you know, I, I identified the advisor I wanted to work for. I told him I want to work for you and pretty much I ended up working for him. And so this was like my experience prior to um, getting a faculty position, even like after um, going to grad school at Duke, when I completed my PhD, I, you know, identified one lab that I wanted to do my postdoc in. I sent an email and I got hired on as a postdoc. So that's my experience up until it was time for me to search for a faculty position where I had a few schools, just like in um, all of my previous academic pathway, just only a few schools I identified. I want to, this is where I want to be. And it was really the first time in my life that I, I faced a lot of rejection. <clears throat> and that was hard for me because I was just used to, you know, saying this is where I want to be. And then it happened. And so um, through that process, I learned a lot about I guess, like resilience and the importance of networking and the importance of just being prepared because when when the opportunity for me to finally have an offer came about and for me to decide where to go. So once I got one offer, so Hopkins was my first offer. And then as soon as I got an offer from Hopkins, it was a really a change in tide. So it was like a a period of drought while I was searching for a faculty position for three years. And then when I got my first raindrop, which was my offer from Hopkins, when it rained, it poured. And I ended up um, getting five offers from universities all over the nation. And it ended up being a really like tough decision for me. And what I learned even now, like on the other side, now that I made it through that process, so to speak, is I, um, a lot of what I went through was preparation for what I need to succeed in my current role. Wow. Mm. Wow. Wow. 
Uh, that's that's big, but that, that is that is big because um, man, a lot of people would be going through that that three year drought <laughs> and start feeling inadequate, mm-hmm. start feeling, oh man, this is not for me. Um, man, I, I did all the, I did everything right. You know, what did I do yeah. wrong? You know, what, 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 what was wrong with me? And some people would throw, throw in the towel. Yeah. And know, honestly, that, that, that was me like that. I went through all those feelings and I almost did throw in the towel until I, I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful that I had supporters and people to encourage me and people who saw my potential and were, and were telling me, don't give up. You have what it takes, like keep trying. There's so many other people Mm -hmm. who are not as, you know, skilled or qualified as you. Like they saw my potential when I was ready to just give up and be like, this is just not going to work out. Mm, wow. wow. And, and we that's what we talk about a support system here on the show. And that's what we like to talk about what, what we want to be for people the support system, because that support system is, is is very important, because just like you're saying, you're used to being the person that's number one. Everybody's looking up to you. Everybody's like, man, I want to be like Bicey. I want to be like Bicey. I want to be like Dr. Bell. Sorry. I want to be like Dr. <laughs> Bell. I want to be like Dr. Bell. I want to be like Dr. Bell. And then when it's your when, when, a lot of times we talk about the person that's in the front. Who backs them up when they feel that stress? Mm-hmm. And that support system is very important because every they say no man's an island, no man stands alone, right? In mm-hmm. your case, no woman's an island, no woman stands alone. So, and it's very important to know who to put around you that could give you that support when you need it. That's so true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, I will tell you, Doctor Bell. She I, one day I'm sitting at work and I see a. Um, a newsletter come out and you had one, it was probably a year and a half ago, maybe two years now, it's been, been some time. And, uh, it said, um, MIT released their 40 under 40 innovators of, I guess the year, I guess. Or something oh, like the that. 35 innovators on the 35. Yeah, that was, that yeah, was, 35. Hey, don't yeah. say 40. Don't give them 40. Yeah, 35. 30, <laughs> 35 innovators. <laughs> <after> 35. <laughs> yeah, that was in 2016. <laughs> Yeah, 2016. Yeah, yeah, she's not that old. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm scrolling through and I see they say, hey, we want to recognize one of our own, um, Dr. Bell. And I'm just like, oh, wow, you know, this is this is an amazing, amazing uh, accomplishment. You know, how, how did it feel to receive that an award like that from such a, you know, distinguished institution? Oh, yeah, that was I mean, that was such an honor. I was very thankful and honored that someone thought enough of me to um, honor me with that award. And it was it was right after that time where I was just transitioning to a faculty position. And it almost felt like, you know, validation that this is where I belong, like despite everything that I went through to get here. This is where I am supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. No, that's amazing. That is amazing. Well, I know it's a couple of years, a few years out, but congratulations again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it sparks the feelings that you had the first time that you saw it. You know? Yeah, that was amazing. Because I mean, if you just because I always watch the list and I looked at, you know, read all the great stories of who came through or who was honored in each, whatever year, like the years preceding me. And so mm-hmm. it was amazing to flip through the book and then see, you know, my profile there. And, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. No, that, that is amazing. Dr. Bell, let me ask you, um, let me flip the script a little bit. You're a go-getter and we could tell from just talking to you in your story um, that, you know, you're a go-getter. Is there anything that you, that you wanted to do that you actually didn't go and conquer because of fear or um, you just didn't take that initiative to go do it? So I would say, Not necessarily like there are things that I wanted that I didn't do, but I wouldn't say it was because of fear. It was more so sacrifice. Like I understand, you know, that sometimes you have to make sacrifices and like, even if I give the example of where, um, where I wanted to go for like my next, my faculty position, like there are a lot of factors that go in, even went into that decision. And okay. a lot of things to consider. And 
uh, whether it's like personal or what my husband prefers or where, you know, it's not just about where, you know, I could get the best, um, like move forward the best in terms of my career goals, but there's also, you know, personal goals and other people, family members, friends, support systems to consider. And so it's always a delicate balance when you have to play all of those different values against each other and figure out, you know, what matters more and where you should place more value Mm -hmm. in order to maybe sacrifice something that you might, that I might want, but at the end of the day, I believe, you know, I am where I need to be and it's the best decision in all factors considered. You've been listening to the Success Journey Show. You can check us out on our social media on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Also on our website, thesuccessjourneyshow.com. Enjoy the rest of the show. So now that you are you're a faculty member and that you you know you um you have your own own position over there and you're doing everything that's that's great at John Hopkins. What do you tell your students when they're going through their, you know, tr- tr- trials and tribulation and they want to give up and they're crying on your shoulder? Because I know they're, I know you're probably putting them through it. So, uh, what 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 are you, what are you telling them? Um, well, I guess I, I try to be a source of encouragement to my students, my undergrad advisees, graduate students, whether they're mine or other graduate students from other professors here. So I, you know, let them know that I believe in their potential, that I, I believe that they have what it takes, even if they don't see it right now. Some of my students like to complain about the homework assignments and I tell them, you know, without, without struggle, there's no progress. So this is how you progress. So, you know, you just got to fight through it and you'll come out on the other side as a better engineer. And if you don't thank me now, you'll thank me later. Um, (laughs) And, you know, just, you know, try to be a source of encouragement because I I was there before and I understand how things can be rigorous. You don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes that's all you really need to hear are those words of encouragement that someone believes in you, even if you are not able to believe in yourself at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. I want to go back for the listeners. I told them we're going to break down at a high, well, not break down at a high level, kind of explain what you do as not just as a faculty member, but your research because it's very interesting. It's cutting edge. You've been traveling the world talking about it. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity just to share with our listeners around the world, you know, what it, what it is that you actually specialize in, in your research. Yeah, so I work. Before you start, I, I'm, we need the ABC version, all right? Okay, okay. Not the- <laughs> <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Okay, so I would say I work. So I work in the area of medical imaging. So I believe we can understand that it's like seeing inside of the body, not invasively, to either make a diagnosis about some health condition or to help surgeons navigate when performing surgery to see different structures in the body that they might either want to target or avoid. So that's the general field of medical imaging. And more specifically, I work with ultrasound imaging, which should be familiar to many, as well as a relatively new technique called photoacoustic imaging, which you can think of as ultrasound with a laser. And so, Mm. um, The way that photoacoustic imaging works is that you have, you know, you transmit light to a structure of interest that absorbs the light and then undergoes heating and then expansion. And then that process generates a sound wave that you detect with conventional ultrasound transducers. And so it's kind of like the concept of lightning and thunder where you have light, a lightning bolt striking through the sky and then the light separates the air surrounding it, causing it to rapidly expand and contract and generate the loud roaring boom that you hear when you hear thunder. And so basically it's like, you know, the concept of lightning and thunder just happening on a smaller scale inside of the body. And so with ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging technologies, 
I work on the signal processing side. So taking the, the raw data as it's received by the ultrasound transducer and applying signal processing techniques that are new and innovative in order to improve image quality or bring out features that are not present with today's um, signal processing techniques that are, might be used in the sonograms that you see in hospitals today, or to help with like diagnosis or screening of breast cancer is another project that we have. And we're also using photoacoustic imaging to guide surgery. So to help surgeons navigate around critical blood vessels that you don't want to injure, but injury to them could be very catastrophic and could po possibly lead to patient death. And we're also integrating our imaging systems with robots. So for example, we integrate the imaging, the photoacoustic imaging systems with minimally invasive robots for performing surgery through incisions that are as small as a keyhole. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's enabled by a surgeon um, moving his hands at one, his or her hands at one console. And then those motions at the console are transmitted through the robot arms to that are then um, basically controlling tools that are actually inside of the patient. So it's like a teleoperation approach. And then we give additional information to help surgeons navigate in that tight workspace. So those are just a few of the examples of <laughs> the type of imaging technology that we develop in my lab. What's so funny? You said just a few. Yeah, because we're doing so much. No, you said just a few right there. Yeah, yeah. All, it is. All I, all I was thinking about was Brooklyn Tech, MIT, Duke. That's if you if you need to break that down, you need those three together. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! And then she said, and then she said, a few. Yeah, because <laughs> there's so much more I can tell you about. Wow! <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing. Hey, Vicey, we uh, I mean, we love what you do, and we really appreciate. You just spending some time with us and just sharing your journey, sharing your story. Tell us one thing about um, Dr. Bell. I keep saying Bicey. So we say Bicey, guys, just to let you know it, that this we is, is a nickname that we call her, call her uh, as, we're, as we're friends, you know, for a few years now, a couple of years now. And uh, so you keep hearing us going back and forth between Dr. Bell and Bicey. First, her <laughs> name is Bi uh, not Bicey. Uh, Dr. Bell. So we're sticking with that. But <laughs> so um, tell tell the listeners something that you do that, you know, outside of work, you mentioned something about personal goals. Uh, what What is one personal goal that you're working on for this year? Oh, for this year? Well, I want to stay fit. So my commitment is to continue running. I like running. So okay. I... I've recently um, started uh, increasing my mileage and I want to at least maintain where my current level. Mm -hmm. And so, because a lot of times it's hard to even find the time to do, do that even. And so I want to make sure that I continue to maintain my health and my and running abilities and, I find that it's also a nice stress reliever. It allows me to just go for a long run and think and come back refreshed and rejuvenated. So um, there's that. And I do love to travel. So I want to continue traveling the world and see all that there is to see as far as time will allow, time commitment. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that you're going to travel the world because I, I would tell you, you know, all, uh, you know, what what you do is is not ordinary I, to me. I don't know if everybody else is. Like, yeah, you don't know about I, that, I, man. We, we talk yeah. about that all the time at lunch. Yeah, yeah, I talk about all the time at, <laughs> oh, oh, at, at the water fountain. Yeah, the water, you know? <laughs> water fountain. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, and it takes a um, you know, God bless you with a special uh, uh ability. I'm telling you because when I hear you talk yeah. about your stuff, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing. So I have no doubt you're going to be going all over the world um to share this you know, the new technology or the research that you're, 
you're, you're embarking upon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing yes. your story with us. We really hope that someone was inspired um, by, by your story. And I know I was even you just, I mean, the little bit that you share with it, there's so much more. Um, and so world travelers, you know, we are coming to the end of another uh, session, another episode. And we really hope that you're enjoying these episodes. Why don't you do us a favor? Can you just go and just leave a review, leave a comment, let us know how these uh, stories are inspiring your life, how they're changing your life and, or how we can improve and, and what we're producing. Or if you're interested in, in us sharing your story with the world, please reach out to us. You can go to our website at, at the success journey show.com. You can email us at the success journey podcast at gmail.com. And we'll be gladly, gladly um, take your information and contact with you and be in contact with you and answer any questions that you may have. So thank you so much for joining us again for another week of the success journey show. We will see you next week at the same time, the same place. All right, everyone have a good one. One love. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Success Journey Show, where your dreams, drive, determination, and diligence are the foundation to success. For more information, check out thesuccessjourneyshow.com. The Journey Squad is here helping you to your destination.